All right. So, uh, Melanie, you're always first on board. So, you mind praying to start us? Computer screen, not just the PowerPoint. I'm sorry. We have the. Do I am I? You gonna? Yeah, we have the. We have the whole your whole computer screen, not just the PowerPoint. Okay. Let me see if I can. Uh, that's going to be the best I can probably do. Can you read it? I was going to say there's nothing wrong with it that I can tell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So will you open okay. us in prayer, Melanie? Sure. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this evening and. You are Lord God Almighty, and we love you. We give you all honor, praise, and glory. You, you are our king, the king of the universe, and we just love you. Thank you for letting us meet this evening. Thank you for the chance of going to these Bible classes and Mark teaching them that we may have knowledge and revelation of your word, Lord. Be with those that aren't with us this evening. Be everyone, everyone that's here. Be with our families wherever they may be. Lord, again, we just thank you. And we ask you to bless this lesson. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's get into it. Let's see. I'm not as fast as I used to be. Did it change? Yes. Okay. Again, uh, First Timothy, we're finishing First Timothy. I'm going to get out to you this week a review paper on first timothy it'll be doing about two weeks and again we're going to be more with the overview than specifics okay we'll look at some things uh, chapter one if you remember was a charge of timothy first timothy two is to pray for all how do you pray prayer first i went through this men and women the church men everywhere lift hands women learn uh qualifications for overseers uh, what to know was two weeks ago and the falling away and how to teach and lead and then uh, how to treat body members, you know, to the younger women as sisters, etc. Today we're going to work at Christians in the workplace. And a final charge is Timothy as this ends the book. And so we'll begin there. So, uh, Courtney, do you mind reading this slide? Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasph blasph blasphemy. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say that. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. Again, Timothy is writing to... Uh, leaders of the church okay well he, timothy is a leader of the church so here is paul writing to him and he and so the things that paul feels are important i think are interesting to us so he's going to talk about the workplace obviously he uses the word uh, bond servants here the greek is dual a which means like servant or slave we, we don't really we're not slaves today most of us right we, but we have employers and, and we're employees and uh under the yoke of their own masters and notice the greek word is despotus can you recognize an english word similar to that despot we get our word despot from that we call like a saddam hussein a despot or whatever fidel castro was a despot or whatever but you know he says if you're a work person you know employed by someone or you're under the work of this he, he said they are worthy of honor and uh uh and if we don't honor them, you know, if, if I'm a Christian and I'm working in the workplace, you know, I, again, I work for a company called Dantex. The, the, the owner was a man named Farley Daniels. His son was Tyler. It was their company. And, you know, people would say they don't run the company right. They don't run the company. And I said, it's not Shoetex, it's Dantex. It's their company. They can run it however they want to run it. You know, if I, if I, if I'm, if I'm on risk on the bottom line, if the company goes broke, I go home, get another job. They, they, they go in debt, you know, and so they are worthy of honor. If I'm a Christian, just, just tearing into the boss and, you know, behind the back saying they're stupid. They don't know what they're doing. This co company stinks. I hate this company. And how many have run into people like that? They're just downers and stuff like that. If we're believers, he says something here that we 
begin to blaspheme God and his doctrine. And, and, and really that word there is kind of like, you know, what we're saying, we're not a witness to those around us. You know, and I tried to be a witness of Dan Tex, you know, he was bipolar. He'd come in one day mad. He was mad at the estimator. And he said, how about I fire the estimator and fire you? And it was like, well, Mr. Daniels, that would not be my first plan, but you know, I, I need this paycheck actually to pay the mortgage. So I would hope you would not fire me, but you know, uh, if I had been one constantly cutting him down, constantly saying stupid, and then said, oh, by the way, I go to church and you should come visit me at my church, people are going to think, well, why would I want to be like you? So he, Paul feels it's an important thing as employers to honor their bosses, okay? An honest day, wait, how many of us heard? Most of us, again, I'm probably speaking to the choir here. Most of us grew up with, you know, a day, an honest day's work for an honest day's wages. Now, again, people have been abused at work and taken advantage of. But he said, you're supposed to honor your boss. Then he said, if you have believing masters, how many have ever worked for a believer? I worked for a believer and he was kind of a pain in the neck, honestly. You know, and I love him as a brother, but he was a pain in the neck. Uh, he, let them not despise them, okay? Because sometimes we can get cross with our boss. He makes, you know, we need to work this Saturday. You know, we start selling a different product and all of a sudden I had to come in every other Saturday. I was salaried. You know, but it was something you had to do because they are not only that, because they're brothers in the Lord. And uh, look who's benefited if we honor them. Be believers in the beloved. It, again, if I'm not, if I'm not, if I'm despising my Christian boss and bad mouthing him everywhere, I'm not benefiting other people. And again, he's going to tell, he's going to give Timothy a specific instruction teach these things. And exhort these things. This is why we're doing this right now. This is why we're, I'm, you know, why we're doing this book right now. These are things Timothy is supposed to teach and exhort. We last, you know, we're following this at our church. And so Saturday night, what did I, oh, I did on, you know, he who doesn't work doesn't eat. The same thing we covered last week. I said, this is a, a tough teaching, but there's a true teaching in here. He says that we're responsible, pay for ourselves. He's saying this, you got to honor your employer. Or you're not honoring God. And if they're a believer, you should really honor them and be supportive of them. I would pray when I work for, Lord, bless this company like you blessed Egypt under uh, Joseph. Bless this company like you blessed, you know, Babylon under Daniel, you know, and uh, that I might be lifted. Any questions or comments on that? Any experiences? You can go ahead, Maria. <laughs> So I was reading somewhere that um, bond servant were slaves or yeah, slaves who had already done their time and they would choose to stay with their masters and then they would um, they would receive like a ring, I think, on their ear, mm -hmm. uh, left or on the right. I don't remember, but it was cool because I think I, I was trying to find the verse where I want to say one of, I want to say it was Paul that he calls himself was a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. so when I read what it was, I was just like, oh my, you know, it's pretty neat. It's like yeah. he, he chose him. And so he would choose to stay with him and for the rest of his life. And so I thought that was pretty neat. I like that. I, I heard a guy once say he was a tough teacher and he said you know you get these things in the mail mark schumacher power ministries mark schumacher prophet theologian right phd lld or whatever and stuff like that he goes geez paul said paul i'm a bond servant of the lord jesus christ you know yeah there's a difference there there's a humility there and you're correct what they would do you could be a servant of someone this is an old testament law and as your time was up, you could go free. Now, if you had children and a wife and that he gave you a wife, they remained with him. But you could say, I love my master. And he actually took an awe and stuck it through your ear and stuck it to the door. And that was your sign that you were bonded to him for life. And it, so it was kind of an interesting. We don't really understand that. It's not in the world we know today. We haven't been exposed to slavery in, in the modern times, our experience with slavery was, you know, the, the, the abuse of African Americans in, in the United States and, and being treated as what was called chattel or property. And uh, the, the, we looked the other way and, you know, Congress, Congress said, well, they're not really people, they're three-fifths of a people, which goes back to the Old Testament too. 
and stuff like that. But finally, we said, wait a minute, everyone's guaranteed to live life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But yeah, we don't own that. We're supposed to be bond servants of Christ, right? So if I'm a bond servant of Christ and he plants me in heart for the world, uh, but I like to worship at uh, New Wine better, <laughs> you know, I, I, I joke, North Americans, you know, we go, well, it, the services are more convenient for me. You know, it's a 10 o'clock service. I like the worship, you know, and stuff like that. And it's really, it, it's kind of hard, you know people have to choose to commit, you know, very few people, you, you, you belong to a big church, Courtney's in a big church, we're a smaller church, you know, not a whole lot of people are committed, right? They're there because what they get out of it. And we're hoping that mindset changes. We hope as they grow in the Lord and they, and they accept this role, Lord, I'm your bond servant. And uh, I'll stay at heart for the world all my life. But if you send me to Macedonia, I'm going to Macedonia, you know, uh, you know, I'll do anything for you, Lord, but go to go overseas. Well, then you're not a bond servant, right? All right, that's my commentary for the day. Uh, let me see who's next on our list. Bruce, do you mind reading? If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wrangling, wranglings, men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Okay. He's teaching, and let, if anyone teaches otherwise, otherwise than what? The teaching that he taught, that, that the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, and also he's just been us a paragraph talking about working, right? If anyone teaches otherwise, he's kind of finishing that thought, and I, I agree, we can say the gospel of Jesus Christ, because we're going to look at this. But he goes, if people are teaching you anything different, they're not consenting to, they're, you know, they're, they're not consenting to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus and the doctrine of, you know, the way to live holy. Uh, and this person is proud. If they're teaching you something different, Paul, you know, he, again, he said, uh, Timothy, teach and exhort these things. And if anyone teaches otherwise, they got a problem. OK, this is God's doc he's calling, you know, wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus and the doctrine, according to God. He is a proud. He knows nothing. So teaching, we had a lot of bad teaching back in those days. We can see we're going to look at this at the end and stuff. And, and really something I want you to get out of first Timothy. Uh, they know nothing, but they're obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. Anyone ever been in an argument over a word with somebody? you know, biblically what it means. I, I think I've shared with most of you have heard this before. I had a friend tell me they were at a Bible study ordering, arguing over a word and the lady two doors down tried to kill herself. And they were just all humbled, you know, because here we were arguing what this word meant or not meant. And the reality of life is happening. And, and what is this thing? So we're arguing about words, uh, and stuff. Uh, and from that comes envy, strife. If we're not living this wholesome doctrine, right? How do we treat younger men? How do we treat older men? How do we treat younger women, older women? You know, how do we raise up elders in this church? How do we pray? If, if we don't do these things, they come, come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions. You ever get the feeling they're against me? You know, geez, Dale didn't say hi to me when I walked into church this morning. <laughs> I tell people, you can't read people's mind. Dale might have kicked the door as he came in by accident. He's, he's struggling not to scream. And you walk by and he didn't say hi. You know, you, you can't believe it. You, useless wranglings. But he says it's constant friction. Again, we all know those people everywhere they go. is It's a whirlwind of headaches and, uh, you know, everything's a problem. Uh, people of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. I love this. People destitute who suppose that, Somehow, living this way godly is a means of gain. I wrote financial in your notes, financial gain, but it's not only that. I mean, people can try and get power through ministry. 
Uh, and he's talking in the context of working. Well, I'm a believer. You should pay me more or whatever. And uh, destitute of the truth, and they suppose, they think, suppose is a dangerous thing, right? Kind of like assume. Uh, godliness is a mean, what do you do with those people? You get away from them, Timothy. You can't really hang around those people. They're, they're going to feed you bad things. And and obviously, if you know, a lot of times, like we'll use teachings, uh, you know, and they're good, but they're famous people's teachings, and they can make a lot of money. You know, if you make write a book and make a, a teaching, you can make a lot of money. And once you get known, people will say, "Oh, I'm going to use uh, you know so and so's book because she's good," and they make a ton of money. And uh, again, no one's forcing you to buy it, so I don't have a problem with it and everything, but generally uh and and hopefully they haven't gone into this to make money and stuff like that but he says there are some people that go into this to make money there's been career religious people you know my grandparents did it, i did it i'm going to take over the church and this is how we live and stuff like that or you know i'm going to be i'm going to my ministry is going to flourish and i'm i'm going to be known or whatever and it's not uh it's not what he says. It's not what the kingdom is about. So I'm going to go. Shotzi, do you mind reading this one? You're muted. Yeah. Okay. Um, First Timothy 5, 6 through 9. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Mm -hmm. Well, this verse right here, number six, if you could write that, tattoo that on your heart, godliness with contentment is great gain. Living in the Lord and being content. Uh, are you content? Is it enough? You know, he told, when they asked John the Baptist, what should I do? He said, you know, to the soldiers, be content with your wages. And that doesn't mean settling, but most of us go through life trying to consume, 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 and consume, consume. And it's a, it's a big responsibility. He said, but man, if you can find godliness, you know, being in tune with the Lord and his people, and contentment, what a great, and look at the Greek word, megas, we get our word mega, mega from that, great gain. Man, if you figure this out, you've got life beat, trust me, and you are a you know, rich person if you figure this out. What does the enemy come to do? Try and tell us we're dissatisfied. You're dissatisfied. You didn't get the corner office. Wow, when they ask people to pray, I haven't been asked to pray. Um uh, I didn't get asked by Mark to read that. The only reason that happens is not all the pictures show at the same time or whatever. And see, so finding this place of godliness and contentment, remember the purpose of the commandment is uh, love from a pure heart, a clean conscience. We're content, okay? And a sincere faith. Godliness with contentment. And those are the people you like being around. You know, godly people who are content are just fun to be around. They're fun people. They're loving people, they're caring people, and you just feel exhorted when you're around them, you know? You got to find those people and hang around them, you know? <laughs> I, I love those kind of people. And he reminds us, we didn't bring anything in this world, and we know this, and we're not going to carry anything out. We have a friend who's wealthy, her husband was put in a home, and the last time I saw him before he passed away, he was in a diaper and a t-shirt. Mm. And, and this is what we, we don't take anything out of this world, right? You ever hear the joke? I got a joke. Can I tell a joke? <laughs> this guy, he asked God, he has all this gold. He says, can I please take it to heaven? Can I please take it to heaven? God, you can't take anything to heaven. So he finally convinced, this is a joke. He finally convinces God. So he dies and goes to heaven. He's hauling these suitcases full of gold. And he gets to the pearly gates. Again, this is not theologically correct, but and Peter says, what's in the suitcases? He opened the suitcases and Peter sees the gold. And Peter goes, you brought pavement? <laughs> Everything <went. laughs> you brought. 
I don't always like that joke or whatever, you know, so we don't have, you know, there's nothing we're going to carry out, you know, you're going to leave it, you know, uh, when the cones were going to uh, uh, Zambia, I went to their yard sale and I saw on there uh, a spring box jersey, I brought it back, especially for my son Christopher from, from South Africa, you know, and it's, there it is, you know, he had to get rid of his clothes and so there's a spring box jerseys. And you, you, you know, most people don't, you know, so there are some heirlooms you get, that's not an heirloom, of course, you know, some heirlooms you might get in treasure and stuff like that. But really most of the stuff that's important to me is not that important to anyone. You're not gonna have anything go with you. So, so you know, there's a, there's a sobriety in this is what is the purpose? And, and he says this, having food and clothing in these, we need to be content. Notice shelter's missing. You know, we say having food, clothing, and shelter, be content. And, and Jesus uh, said this to, in Luke. He said, when, uh, he said, life is more than food, and the body's more than clothing. Don't you understand? These things are just, you know, you have to have food to live, and we kind of have to have clothes to get around. And uh, if you have those basic things, be content. I mean, God's blessed probably most of us with houses and stuff like that and, and vehicles to get around. But sometimes, you know, the cones haven't owned a house. They don't own a house, you know, and they've lived in different places, you know, and maybe one day they'll settle down and have a house. You know, sometimes you can go live for the Lord and and he takes you from place to place. And they had a pretty cool house in Zombie. I got to go see it. I love it. An awesome house, you know. Uh, but those, if, if, if you don't find this contentment, here's this problem with this contentment. The enemy's always coming in. He's telling Timothy, the enemy's coming in and going to tell you. And he'll fill you the desire to be rich. I can buy whatever I want to buy, you know. I need this. They can fall into temptation. There's a temptation go with that, right? Have you ever bought anything and it's come out your nostrils? You know, you know, the phrase come out your nostrils goes back to the, the quail. We haven't had meat. And so the Lord said, I'll give you quail. And he said, I'm going to send quail till you know, this taste of it just comes out your nostrils. You know, you bought that expensive pair of pants or whatever, or suit or whatever. And the first time you wore it, you spilled something on it and stained it, you know, or whatever. And we do this and we fall into these temptations. And then, then there's a trap that can come with this, right? Uh, how many of us know you can get a big raise and your lifestyle just grows to that raise, right? And pretty soon you're living paycheck to paycheck. I, I, you're shaking your head. Yes, thank you. Because I'm not the only one. <laughs> Okay, not the only one that does that. You know, you're thinking, boy, there's more money I ever made in my life. And, well, you know, no, pretty soon the expenses are more. Oh, the, I got to have insurance on that third car. I got to have this. Oh, the boat. Now I need insurance on the boat. Got to pay the dock fees or whatever. Uh, and on and on and on becomes a trap and into many foolish and harmful lust. We get drawn, drawn away which drown men in destruction and perdition. If anyone's ever seen the story of Howard Hughes, at one time was probably the richest man in the world, Howard Hughes's father, or fa him or his father invented the rotary drilling bit, which revolutionized the oil drilling industry, and they made zillions. Uh, there's still a company called Hughes Tool Company. I think the vineyard in Houston actually took over their old building. But if you go through Midland, you'll see Hughes Tool. But he made all this money and became the richest person. Yet he had this psycho, psychotic problems and stuff like that. And if you remember, he died alone, long fingernails and hair. You know, who could prevent him from having anything? And yet we, we see that we drowned in destruction and per perdition. You can pray to win the lottery. God in his infinite wisdom is probably going to not let most of us win the lottery because we would probably destroy our lives if we won the lottery, you know. Uh, I don't trust myself in that, honestly, you know. Mark? Yeah. Lately, I've been going to some auctions. And, you know, Almogordo's littler, so we have neat little auctions. But a lot of, the, like last weekend, the two places were, the people had to go to nursing homes. So it's kind of sobering going and looking at their items uh, that they've used and they've had, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I found the bowl that I broke mine just like it three, three ah! months ago. So it was it was neat to find a bowl like that. But um, it's kind of hard 
these people's lives and then I come back and look at my own stuff I have at the hit house and I say I need to get rid of stuff you know <laughs> yeah need to get rid of stuff yeah Good. Too much that's, stuff. A good, that's good wisdom someone shared that they were doing their uh fathers and their mothers who died a few years before stuff and they had kept everything and they said don't do it to your kids you know and we're having to go sort through all these papers and everything and yeah so see my room here everything on the walls yeah that's what the whole house looks like <laughs> yeah so courtney you can throw everything away you don't want okay <laughs> when we're gone it's all right there's nothing special or heirlooms around here or whatever oh uh, all right. Who is mine? Irma. Do you mind? You got one verse, Irma. Oops. Oh. Okay. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Yeah, again, here's wise advice from Paul. And again, it's not money's not the root of all evil, it's the love. And I love the Greek. Again, I'm not a Greek scholar, but it comes from the word philos, like love. Peter, do you feel agape me? I philos you. And argos, which is silver, the, literally the love of silver. The love of money is, and I've read this before, but the word root really jumped out at me at this time. Remember the... Uh, I, I, I quoted here Hebrews 12, looking carry less any root of bitterness. And when uh, John the Baptist said he's coming and his axe is ready for the root, he's going to cut the root, the, the root that feeds us. And we're also told that we're engrafted. Those of you who went through Romans with us, we're engrafted into the nation of Israel, but they're the root. They're the root. The, the root is the thing that... Uh, you know, brings life to us. The trees have these giant roots you can't see under the ground. And money is a root. And, and we don't see roots, do we? Too often. But they kind of, and the nutrition comes from them, they begin to feed the body. And it's the root that leads to all sorts of evil. And again, because some of it, the love of money, they've strayed from the freight, freight in their greed. How many of you are greedy? How many are willing to admit they agree? Okay. Yes, we have, you know, what's it, what's little children's favorite word? Mine, right? No, it's yours and Billy's. No, it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. <laughs> How did your twins do on that, Courtney? Did they share? <laughs> they didn't share mine. <laughs> you know, we tried to get them two of everything or whatever. You know, it appeals to that greed, that 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 thing, you know, Paul says, I beat my body in subjection. You know, they, they, this, this, this stuff is in us if we're not careful. And then they pierce themselves through. With One men. of the greatest Go ahead. Uh, blessings of moving to El Paso was it forced us to downsize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's really, why do I need all this stuff? You know, and, and, and we acquire it and, and stuff like that. Can't take it with you. And yeah, it is a good thing. And uh, how many people rue their life? Again, I, I, why, years ago, I heard a radio program of people who had won the lottery and literally their life fell apart. Their marriages fell apart. Their family fell apart, you know. Everyone, they couldn't trust anyone. Everyone was out, you know, wanted to be their friend for a reason and stuff like that. And just many sorrows and to look back on your life. And, and we've all met people who have, you know, brothers and sisters in the Lord who made the wrong decisions and, and their lives are shipwrecked. And it's like, oh man, I don't want that. And I don't want to end up being bitter and miserable in my life. My kids hating me, my wife hating me. The church hating me, everybody hating me, the dog not even liking me, and stuff like that. So, I mean, we probably all met people like this. That it's just a, it's just a horrible, horrible situation, and it's like, but we got drawn away, we strayed because we thought money would buy happiness, and, and money doesn't, you know. All righty, so Irma. Maria, do you mind reading? 
Let you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Mm -hmm. But you, O man, and again, as I'm studying the Bible these days, verbs jump out at me. Here's a verb. But you, O man, flee. Now he's kind of going to this final charge. He's, you know, we're getting the second half of the chapter. Flee these things. Flee the greed. Flee getting enticed by money, being drawn away by, by these things. Again, a, a job offering to pay you 40% more in Denver might be the Lord moving you. But it also might be the enemy telling you, you know, trying to take you away from what God's doing in your life. And those are the things we have to be willing to say, Lord, give me wisdom. You know, if it be your will, I'm going to jump on this and go. But if it's not your will, so flee these things. So here's a church leader, and he's got to flee these things. It's a verb. It's a choice. Uh, and then we and he, and he says to pr pursue these things. And again, he was supposed to be an example in most of these things, right, in these things. But pursue righteousness. Again, pursue is a verb, right? Don't read about or don't, you know, but there's a pursuit of it. There's a pursuit of righteousness. There's a pursuit of godliness. There's a pursuit of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. Guess what? If I want to pursue faith, I should be reading the word of God, right? Be involved in the word of God. Pursue love. Uh, pursue patience. This is one I'm still pursuing. I'm way behind on this one, but I'm still working. I'm still pursuing pay. Lord, give me patience. Gentleness. And then uh, this is the theme of our sermon series at uh, New Wine is fight the good fight of faith. Again, look at the verb. Fight. I keep showing them a slide of weeds. The only thing in this world that grows without discipline and grows without pruning and grows without correction are weeds you know we've had all this rain so we got all these weeds everywhere so we have to fight this good fight of faith and fight means there's a discipline fight means there's an energy put in it and and you know it's a commitment you know a prize fighter has to commit their life to it you know it's it's not there actually is a skill involved in it you know and you know brute strength is great but you find that you know, if you don't have the skill, brute strength won't carry you. And so you have to fight the good. And the Christian walk is what? A fight sometimes, isn't it? It is a fight because there's things lowering me. Crazy neighbors, crazy kids, or, or you know, <laughs> all sorts of things that, you know, again, I didn't get the corner office. All these things are pulling on my mind i'm being fed da, 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 da. and it's like no fight that good fight lay hold lay hold of eternal life wow eternal life's just going to drop in your lap no you got to lay hold on it and hang on to it uh to what you're called and i love this and confess the good confession in the presence of many witnesses okay so again the theme of first timothy to me is fight the good fight we are in a battle. We know we're in a battle. Our, war, our weapons are not carnal, but they're spiritual and they're mighty. And some of you are in a, a desperate fight for your children or your grandchildren or your siblings or whatever. And some of you are in a desperate fight for family members who are ill or very ill. There's a seriousness about that. And we have to fight for that, don't we? It just doesn't happen. Are you a fighter? All right. Monica? Sure. First Timothy 6, 13 through 16. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ is appearing which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only uh, potentate. 
potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in inapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Amen. Okay, again, so he's going into this charge. And again, we looked at last week, he goes, I charge you before God, his son and the angels, you keep these things without partiality or prejudice, right? Here again, he's charging them strongly. I'm charging, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things before Jesus Christ, who was before Pontius Pilate, you know, when he could have reviled and reviled back. He didn't. I charge before them that you keep this commandment. You keep these things I'm telling you, Timothy. Uh, so if he's charged to keep it, that means he can lose it, can he? Now, I, again, I'm not going to argue about salvation here, but we can unwalk the walk, can't we? We can we can kind of lose that grace that he has for us, and, and we can walk away and our life becomes shipwrecked. If Timothy needs to be urged to keep the commandment, you and I, how much more do we need to be urged to keep the commandment right uh and i love and then i love paul this is you know uh this is he this is kind of his own version of the amplified bible right when he goes on to describe uh he which he who is blessed and the only potent he goes he who is blessed the only potentate the king of kings the lord of lords who alone has immortality he dwells in imploachable light who no man has seen to him be glory and forever and ever why do you do this? Why do you keep this commandment? Because he's worthy, isn't he? The only reason we can keep it is because of him. And the only reason we should keep it is because of who he is, right? Because he is this great one. All righty. So I think I'm back to Melanie. Is everyone read? Whoops. Can you see it, Command? Yes. Okay. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Mm -hmm. So again, he's going to say uh, command again, not exhort command those who are rich in this present age, not to be haughty, you know, <laughs> see my rings, <laughs> see my bling or to trust. I love that. I love this writing uncertain riches. You know, money comes and money goes, doesn't it? It can come and go very quick. But instead of trusting those, trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. By the way, if you live in North America, you are rich, okay? You may not be in the, you know, seven-figure income, but you are rich, okay? And look, at God gives us richly all things to enjoy. Do we need a house? No, but he gave us a house. He gave many of us a house to enjoy, right? Again, our kids may not care for it or whatever. They'll probably sell it and, you know, split the proceeds or whatever, which is okay. But he's, he's given us things to enjoy. He's not a stingy God, but because he's blessed us, then let us do good. Now, if I'm going to hold on to all this money, remember where he said moth will eat and it'll, it'll, it'll rust, it'll, it'll corrupt, be away. Do good. Be rich in good works. Ready to give. Willing to share. One of our ladies at church who's a widow has a pretty decent income from her husband. We had a case years ago. Our youth were going to Guatemala. And one girl had saved all of her money. And she had it in her account with a debit card. And her little sister got a hold of her debit card and didn't realize what she's doing, but she spent $400 on video games on the phone. Anyone ever had that problem <laughs> in their household? And so they put the money in her parents' account. Unfortunately, her parents are not fiscally responsible, and the bank took out another $600 
for the car insurance they didn't pay. They had a car finance and they did not pay the insurance. And you know, when the bank takes out for your comprehensive insurance, it's not 150 a month, they took out $600. So it's a week and a half before these kids are going to go to Guatemala and she's not going, you know, and we prayed for a miracle for her. And we have a widow in the church that has a pretty neat thing. She said, I just feel God. And she didn't know the number or anything. She came in and gave a check for a thousand dollars. That girl got to go to Guatemala and I got to see a picture of her on a swing in Guatemala, reading her Bible, doing her morning devotion. And I was just so blessed that this widow was willing to share and that her faith carried her through. You know, it was just such a wonderful and rich territory. Storing up for themselves a good foundation from time to time that they may lay hold of eternal. Do these things. You've been, you've been given blessed. Be willing to share. If ever we um, feel like we're not very well off, it might be a good idea to remember that um if you had a choice mm -hmm. of what to eat for breakfast this morning if you had a choice of what to put on this morning yeah you're better off than 90 percent of the world's population yeah that's very true shotsy very true if you have a bed to lay down in a night you're ahead of a lot of the world you know we, we just take these things for granted. Well, I need the extra Sealy double wide, you know, blow up mattress. And, and again, there's, I'm not being facetious. I'm just saying we don't realize how rich all of us are. Are, are you willing to share? And those, that thing just increased my faith so much, you know, and that little girl had no idea who gave the money because the lady wanted to remain anonymous, but her faithfulness got her to Guatemala. And so because someone was willing to share, my kids have been able to live in Zambia for years because people have been willing to share, you know, say, we believe in what you're doing. We're going to pay for your expenses. We're going to pay for you to fly back and forth to Zambia once a year. We're going to pay for a house for you to live in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because people wanted to share, you know, most missions are funded, you know, by what people sharing what were the three things in missions uh shotzi you might remember this the goers the funders and the encouragers or i may have that wrong or whatever but there's about 10 to 1 for every missionary goes there's about 10 people that support them either in prayer or financially giving and it's one of the ways the gospel has went across the world so he said in, in the rich you've been made rich for a reason god has you were born in the united states for a reason you were born and given a 401k by your company for a reason or whatever. And that's okay. You've been given the salary for a reason. What you do with the salary is up to you. Remember when Peter, uh, when uh, Ananias and Sapphira brought the land, he said, the land was yours to do whatever you wanted to. And if you sold it for this much and wanted to give us 10 cents on the dollar, that's fine. You could have done it. But you came and lied to the Holy Spirit and said you sold the land for this much when you didn't sell it for this much. And that's really not, a, you know, uh, you're lying to the Holy Spirit in a sense there. Uh, whoops. I know many others that go believe like I do, but once I realized that my money was not my money, it was God's money that it just broke something loose in my life that I could just trust the Lord for everything for the provisions. And if he said, give a hundred dollars to this, I would give it and not worry about it because he's mm -hmm. my provider. And that's so freeing. Um, when we learn that yes. I lived many years, you know, my, my money, my money. And, uh, once I learned it, it was so freeing. I fought tithing for years, guys. I don't know if any did. I fought tithing. Well, you know, I don't know if the church, they're doing pretty well. Maybe I should give some to these guys and some to these guys. And finally, like you said, it's his money. Okay, I'm just going to give 10% to them. And if they, you know, this is what I believe I'm supposed to do. And if they misuse it, that's going to be their problem. And it all works out. And it does work out. It does work out. Uh, Praise it's God. It's amazing. All righty. Uh, one of the last slides here. So, Courtney, we're back to you. 
O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Again, Timothy, guard is a verb, right? You have to guard these things. That, and, and what's committed to you by God? We talk, you talked about the, lay, the gift of the laying on the hands by the presbytery or, or the elders. You have these gifts. There's been things committed to you. You have a ministry. These things are committed to you, uh, committed to your trust by God. God has committed stuff to you in trust. You got to guard those things. You know, uh, when you begin to think ministry stinks, you have to be careful because we get tired and we're not running, we're not, when we begin, we're running on inertia, we're not being fed, we're not in his presence, and it begins to take a toll on us, and uh, we can lose the commitment, oh God, I got to go lead worship again, you know, you know, I hope your worship leaders never show up, you know, I, I know Annie, uh, they were, had some devastating news, we, we meet on Saturday, had devastating news on a Saturday morning, and she had to come in and lead worship. And I said, Annie, it's a sacrifice of prayer tonight you have to give. But she did it. You know, it was her gift that God's given her. And, of course, when she leads worship, my guy's going to testify. The Holy Spirit shows up and stuff like that. We have to guard. I don't know how many ways to say what Paul's told First Timothy, it doesn't happen by chance, and you better hang on to it. You better lay hold of it and grasp it hard, because it will slip out of your fingers faster than you can think of. Avoid idle babblings and contradictions, which are falsely called knowledge. Do you see that today? Yeah, it's everywhere, right? Uh, you can abort. We should be able to board up to birth. There was a state they thought I, I read someplace was considering even, you know, past birth, you know, it's not going to pass, we hope and stuff, whatever, but falsely called knowledge. We were ministering a young guy the other night. He's just a smart kid, you know, and his intellectualism is one of his hardest things with his faith. But it's like God has given you that gift for a reason, because the world's out there thinking they have knowledge. And they need to be understand their knowledge is foolishness the fool you know the, the, the god's foolishness is wiser than the wisdom of man and by professing this you know people ha handling this they've strayed away from the faith well you know i started and there's been so you've heard the term deconstruction people begin to uh, question their faith and they begin to walk away from their faith they call it deconstruction and there's been people in the music industry some in churches have walked away from the faith. You see them on Facebook now. Boy, once they do, they, the media loves them. Oh, tell us what's wrong with Christianity or whatever. And what happened is that you're going to see these things happen in their lives and they stray from the faith. Grace to you. Amen. Uh, again, we, we saw this as, uh, again, the things laying on of hands. I wanted to do a little personal thing here okay this reminded me of this i wrote bail anyone ever heard of bail i was at a seminar one time and and you may have heard this and they said the problem with america today is the worship of bail people are worshiping bail and everyone said amen 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 and uh and then i found out you know how many times bales mentioned in the new testament you know how many times jesus mentioned bail Zero. Zero. Yeah, how many times Timothy mentioned or uh, Peter mentioned Baal? Zero. Luke, Matthew, Mark, zero. Mentioned one time. Can you see that? Paul's making an odd reference. He's talking about uh, Israel, right? And that, uh, you know, even though they haven't come to the Lord yet, God's got a plan for them. And he, sa and he says, what does the divine response say to them you know when uh elijah said i'm the only one he said there are not seven th there are seven thousand that have not bowed their feet to baal this is the only time baal's mentioned in the new testament and it's really not about the worship of baal right so 
Paul was not concerned about the worship of Baal, okay? What was Paul concerned about? And th this is probably what I'm going to ask you. I'm probably going to give you these references and ask you, this is going to be part of your final. He was more concerned about giving heed to fables and endless genealogy, things that cause disputes in godly. In the latter times, people will depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared. And then we tonight, O Timothy, guard what was committed to you, avoid profane and idle babblings and contradictions, which is falsely called knowledge. What's one of the greatest threats to the church today? I don't think it's the worship of Baal. Could be wrong. I'm not you know, I'm not belittling that or whatever, but Paul says, tends to think it's, we get caught in these side bars here. We get caught in these things that don't matter. You know, Christ was born and came in the flesh according to my gospel. He died according to my body, buried and raised from the dead on the third day according to my gospel. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, a clean conscience, and a sincere faith. Anything else we get out there gets kind of wacky right again who were the sons of men who had intercourse with the daughters of women okay where did Cain's wife come from I don't know or whatever and we get off on these things these things called wisdom people want to always have you called wisdom yeah go to uh, again you can go to YouTube look for prophecy today prophecy 2022 there's some really good stuff because we know in part and see in part but there's some really crazy stuff out there and to me that's more the problem and the threat to the church today than anything else. Any questions or comments? That concludes the, tonight's lesson. I do. Go ahead. Um, on that verse 20, O Timothy, guard what was committed. The last word, knowledge. I have in my Bible written science. You have you what? Have, I have that where it says what? is falsely called knowledge mm -hmm. in my bible i have written science yeah that's probably yeah we we worship science today right believe the science haven't you heard that lately you better believe the science and uh one thing we you know is to put that over god's word yeah uh, uh what, yeah, what is wanna... seen what is seen and what is not seen mm -hmm. that's, what, that's how people want to <clears throat> Yeah, we've, all, we've almost made science a cult. Science mm -hmm. become, we, We've seen it with the COVID uh, vaccine, and we've seen it with global warming. And there are smart people on both sides of the spectrum, and people will attack you if you're on one side or the other side. You know, on one side or the other side, you know, you're a denier. You're a climate denier. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some smarter people than me that are, that tend to agree with what I believe rather what is there and you're making decisions, uh, you know, uh, things we've seen come out about the vaccine of the limited effectiveness, the side effects, and yet the CDC voted this week that they want to include it in the vaccines for little children. Mm. We just had a little Sarah vaccine uh, two weeks ago, right? Now they say we want to add the COVID-19 to it. I'm like, oh boy, I don't know. I, I don't know. And so it's like science has become the cult. And, and that and exactly what he's saying here is that it's falsely called knowledge or it's falsely called truth. And yeah. you know, science loves to be examined. You know? I was just gonna add one more thing. I, sure. I think that being brought up because um we I, I feel like Satan's kind of intensifying his attacks and and i i see that as one thing that he's doing as a weapon is to draw the brethren away is some of that false uh doctrine and knowledge mm -hmm. and um you know even through the division as you're saying and science and people's beliefs and so it is true we do need to guard ourselves and remind our family to mm -hmm. guard their hearts and and encourage others in the faith because i i believe that's true i'm seeing quite a bit of it i'm yeah. in the spirit realm even yes amen amen yes that's a good lesson guard our hearts we better guard i got it timothy's got to guard his heart 
guys, I need to go. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I think he was ahead of me. All right, guys. Thank you. Mark, and, yeah. I got another question. <laughs> okay. Uh, our uh, classes on Thursday night with Dr. Jim, mm -hmm. uh, we're doing the seven churches of Revelation. Okay. And uh, we've been bringing up the, the different churches have a lot of the different gods. And we brought up the book, The Return of the Gods by Jonathan Kahn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't read it yet, but I do have it. But I can see how Satan is using these um, in our lives today. You know, it's not mentioned in the New Testament. And I know what you're saying, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the main thing. Yeah. But we do have these different spirits and uh, different gods from the past mm -hmm. that are still at work. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just said, I, you know, I just want to say it all to Baalism because Baal is not a concern. Baal is not a concern. For, but also, Paul says, our weapon is, you know, our weapons are not carnal. They're spiritual and that we are fighting in the spirit and we do need the armor of God. That's part of guarding our heart is putting on the armor of God because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against spiritual spirits and principalities and wickedness in high places, right? And and uh, and, they, and they haven't changed, you know, and they're there and they come out under new forms and, and new ways of doing it. And, and, and that is very much part of the, uh, the instruction of Paul, too, you know, uh, and, and I'm not belittling that at all. You know, we are in a war. This fight the fight. Yeah. Says there are times we have to go head to head, you know, but you better be ready. You better be prepared. You better have your armor on. All right. I'm going to close in prayer again. We're not meeting next week, so we'll be back on the 6th of November. I can't remember what it is, but the 7th of November, I believe. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for these unbelievable wisdom that you gave to Timothy. I mean, that through Paul that you gave, and, and not only through Timothy, you, you've given it to us by recording it in your word and said it's all profitable for doctrine. And we understand, Father, in the warnings of not giving heed to junk and not being deceived, not giving heed to stupid things and to uh, avoid these things, Father. We, we want to in our lives, Father. We do want to fight the fight where the fight is, Lord, and not against rumors and stuff. And we want to be prepared, Father. Help us to guard our hearts as we continue to grow and teach us, as you told Timothy, to wage the warfare rightly, to wage it smartly, O oh Lord, that we might fight the fight of faith, that we would lay hold of eternal life, not only for ourselves, to be, to be encouragers and exhorters of others, Father. We bless you, Lord, as we see these days get evil and eviler, Father, but your grace is mightier. Bless each and every one, Father. Bless them in this coming week, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Mark, Bye. I have a quick question for you. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry, it doesn't require everybody else to listen into. I was just oh, um, okay. <laughs> See you later. Have a good night. Uh, adios. I just want.